Welcome, I'm your host, Malcolm Gallagher. From our BizVision studios in the UK, you are watching the Leadership Matters show on the BBTV network. Yes, the COVID pandemic has had a devastating effect on many lives and businesses, but at the same time, it's claimed that the world has stepped forward seven years in as many months. We're now in a new altered business world, and here at BizVision with our consciousness brands, we think that we may be there for the good, social good. Emerging with strength is what we term as the conscious leader. Here on our show, we talk about conscious leadership a lot, but what does such a leader look like, act and do? That's our continuing quest. Today, I've got a very special guest to chat about it. He's a former SAS commander turned holistic leadership coach. Let's meet Floyd Woodrow. Welcome, Floyd. Welcome, it's a pleasure. Lovely to talk to you, Floyd. Floyd, I really want to get your thoughts on what makes a, a good conscious leader. But before we delve into that, can you please briefly tell my viewers who Floyd Woodrow is, what you do, and who you do it for? Of course, I'd love to. Um, well, my career starts, I was uh, born in Bradford in West Yorkshire. Oh. Uh, and as a small child, I had dreams of doing lots of different things. But uh, one of the biggest ones I had was to go into the military. I joined the parachute regiment when I was um, 17 and a half, uh, and then I joined the special air service when I was 22. I went right the way through the ranks, so I started as a private, I finished as a major. I worked in every operational area that we have uh, been involved in since, uh, since again, 1981. Um, I studied law and psychology whilst I was in the military and did lots of, lots of different jobs. I then came out into business in 2008. I felt that I wasn't growing anymore in the military, and I wanted to try my hand at other areas. So I went into business. I run a number of different companies from foreign exchange to media to security. Uh, but at the same time, I started to develop my leadership and development company. And um, so from 2008, I've just been learning lots of different skill sets. Uh, I've worked with every sector. I've worked with international sports teams. And I now work um, quite heavily in education with a program I've got called the uh, Compass for Life. And that in a really short, sharp uh, way yeah. you up to today. Yeah, I, I fascinated that you're from Bradford. Fifty percent of our audience comes from there. You know, well, it's my, my wife's mother lives there. Um, okay, <laughs> I watched clips from the SAS training, and without doubt, they are the elite, and quite rightly respected, even feared around the world. I'm finding that hardness, you know, the who dares win style, slightly inconsistent with consciousness. Or am I wrong? Right, it's interesting. So if we just take, if we take the television program that sometimes you, you can see, I mean, that is designed for television. It's, uh, it has no reflection whatsoever on what the special air service is all about. So for example, I ran selection for two years. So I, I ran the United Kingdom Special Forces Selection, which is the way the SBS and the SES recruit um, both soldiers and officers. Uh, I never shouted at a soldier uh, at all during my entire time because what we're looking for is soldiers that are conscious leaders that have the ability to work by themselves so they have autonomy um, but they're, they're very good at working within teams and remembering that the special air service when we say who dares wins we are a peacekeeping force actually we are there for support and influence our whole being is to make sure that we are to prevent things from happening. And I've been involved in more peacekeeping operations than any other, other element. Uh, we're also um, able, when necessary, to still fight. So I think conscious leadership is also about having the strength of character to stand up for what you believe and to make sure that when people, and in this day and age, we have to be, again, aware that it's a fragile world. Uh, and unfortunately, and with certain leaders, they require you to stand up to them to make sure that you are going in to, to assist them. And again, I think one of the great things about the Special Air Service, we've also been involved in arresting war criminals. We've been involved, and that's right the way back since our inception. We have not forgiven people in that way. We just made sure they've been brought to justice. And when I've been, been, been brought to justice, we have brought them and handed them over to lawful organizations Unfortunately, sometimes we get renowned for the, all the exciting things going into the Iranian embassy, going through doors and windows, and, and, and that's what we get seen for. But there is so much work that goes on behind the scenes to prevent things from happening. I, I would say that we are one of the, um, the preeminent groups that look at conscious leadership as a whole. Fascinating, yes. Uh, tell us about your Compass programme. 
Oh, thank you. Um, the Compass Programme, one of the things that I learned when I stepped out of the military was obviously you've got leadership skills and I'd worked with lots of different groups. So I understood some of the different ways of leading. Um, but as I went through um, working with probably every sector now and more sporting teams, I realized there's a, a way of looking at things in a slightly different way. And what I wanted to do was collate things in a simple, a simple model. And one day I was looking at a, a screen working on how I can present leadership in a, in a concise way. As you know, Mark, and there's a thousand and one different <laughs> concepts out there. You and I could sit and talk about different leadership styles day in, day out. And there's 10,000 books, I think, go out every year on leadership. So there's lots of different opinions. But how do you make it simple enough for children to understand, as well as senior executives, but also have a lot of depth behind, uh, in terms of research behind what you're saying? And I was looking at your board and I had always, I've always spoken about the super North Star, the North Point from the Compass, it points north. That's about your direction of travel, where you want to be in three, five or 10 years from a personal and professional perspective. Remembering that for me, life is an adventure of experiences to be the best version of yourself. So the North Star just draws you forward on that journey. The South Cardinal is about your ability to be a strategist. That's about logic, analysis, facts, figures, detail, but wisdom, common sense, and judgment to apply that information correctly. Milestones, having a team around you. East Cardinal is about values. And that's about the things that we stand for, but it's about strength of strength of character to make sure we hold to those values and the team code of conduct. And the same for warrior. Warrior is about resilience, physical and mental resilience. And I don't mean that you're big and tough. I mean that you've got the strength of character to, to get to the milestones that you set yourself. Indeed, I was talking to a, a group of children the other day and I said, what does a warrior mean to you? And the little girl stepped forward, uh, no more than nine years of age. And she just said, it's not what you believe it is. It's not about strength and, and, and being able to fight. It's about what happens inside you. And again, that's exactly what you talk about, Malcolm, which is the conscious leader that has the inner strength. The compass is about getting that, those cardinals in equilibrium. The map that you have is about the terrain that you cross as you go through this moment in time. So I've had five different jobs already. It's just a different map, a different set of obstacles, a different route to take. I talk about having the map encompass in equilibrium. And of course, there's enormous depth then to each of the cardinals that I set myself. And so what we've done is we've got programs now that um, highlight what the compass is about. But then we start to take people down each cardinal so they can become better, more aware about what leadership is in those specific areas. And I use the same program, the same program with five-year-old children to some of the top business leaders in the world. I don't have to change it because of the simplicity of what I'm doing. Hmm. Fascinating. I like it. And I hope you remember that nine-year-old when she's prime minister in the future, because she's on the way there, isn't she? Oh, I, that is I, yeah. yeah. I said in my opening piece that the world has altered so quickly. I, people are talking about new normal and things like that. I'm using the word altered. What new leadership skills do you think today's business leaders need to learn or improve upon quickly? Um, they need to improve upon their communication yeah. and they need to make sure that they are adapting their communication style. One style of communicating does not fit all. So the skill is to be able to take people with you. I think that's probably one of the most important things that a leader can um, ensure is in place. I think there's a lack of direction. I, I go to a lot of businesses and again, I talk about the super North Star. And I often say to groups, I want everyone to stand up and I want you to point to where you think north is. And of course, what you'll find is everybody points in a different direction. Um, and I say, of course, because that means your, your journey is that's for you. That's your journey through life. But as a team, do you point in the same direction? Uh, and I can assure you it is rare that an organization has a super north star that is transmitted from top to bottom. When it is, there's an energy and an electricity to the group. I think that's really important. And the other key thing for me at this moment in time is values, is I think values, unfortunately, can get there in a, in a great day and when everything in the world's going well, we all talk about values and the things that we, we espouse as great behaviours, but under pressure, some of those values get comp gets compromised. And I would say that making sure, again, those values that are in place, I think is really, really important. As a member of the SAS, you have to be prepared to go anywhere at any time and tackle anything. 
So you must be adaptable to all situations. I believe that is what today's leader also needs to be, agile and adaptable. What advice can you pass on here? Yeah, it's really important. And now what I would say about all of the different areas that I've operated in, and you are quite correct, we've got to be agile and adaptable. But I would also say there are just some fundamental principles that do not change. And I think that's one of the key elements is how do I become consistently good? And so I would always come back to the first thing is about um, yourself is making sure, again, you're in a great place. Um, you're in a place that can operate at a really high level, but you're looking at some simple things. And again, that ability to have physical resilience, to make sure you have the right energy, the appropriate skill sets, and to make sure, again, those skill sets that we know make us successful um, need to be in place, that we have a great product, that we understand that we've got the right team. We're developing that team to the, to the highest levels. We're making sure we're communicating internally and externally. I think there are just some core things that enable you to have foundations which are non-negotiable. So no matter what happens, once these foundations are in place, we, we are able to operate from a safe base. But then it's about innovation. The most important thing for me is that you're also looking at how, where do I get the edge in the environment? How do I start to look ahead and not just think about the obstacles that are in play, but what am I going to do about those obstacles? What's the solutions? Critical thinking, taking time out to think about these things as a team to make sure that we're maximizing our opportunities. And I think every time I go into a difficult area, the first word that comes into my head is what's the opportunity here? Where can I look at this from a positive perspective, a creative perspective? What are the dangers? And then I make a decision on where we need to be. I do not do that in isolation though. I make sure we're taking time out to think about this. And again, it's not just about me, it's about my team. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate something I thought you was fascinate then, Lloyd. Lloyd, you say, take time out, take time out. And that's what leaders don't do, do they? Just before we move on to the next uh, question, I just want to remind viewers uh, behind me on the screen is the URL to go and find out more about Floyd. And for listeners, I'll just repeat it. It's floydwoodrow.com, floydwoodrow.com. Floyd, the academics and I fall out often as they say that brands make profits. And I say, no, teams, people make profits. Can you support me on this? What's uh, behind creating and motivating a good and reliable team today? Oh, well, without a doubt. I mean, the, the most important thing is your team is absolutely vital. I've just been doing some work with a number of different groups. And there's absolutely no doubt the key to all of those groups performing well is that we have the right team. And the right team is a group where they have personal development. They now feel that they belong in this team. That's about creating trust. Trust is not about like, though. Trust is about respect. That means that we can talk about our weaknesses, our mistakes, our behaviors, and we get to a point where we're completely open without filters. So that means that we understand one another. I understand what makes you tick, Malcolm. And once I know about conscious leadership, then we've got something that we realize we're aligned to. That means we listen to one another. This is about good communication skills. And again, that trust comes from understanding how to adapt your communication style. That's probably critical for me, that adaptation. Um, and because I understand why, how I communicate, but again, why people are different. Then I want passionate debate. Passionate debate means that actually we've got challenge to the to the problem and what the, the key there is, it's not about consensus or democracy leaders lead, but what I want to do is get the best information out from a solution perspective. I always talk about having solutions. I don't want people just to give me more problems and tell me the world's in a bad place. Kind of know that, give me a solution then, give me a better plan or improve my plan. But it's also the willingness for a leader to also within that, to challenge the team and go against the team if they believe they're correct because they've got trust. Then it's about commitment, which means once we've agreed, we deliver. The team delivers on what was said, but we're also creating a high support, high challenge environment, which means we're accountable. High support, high challenge, and that's the research suggests that's the best environment. Too much high support doesn't work. Too much high challenge doesn't work. What I need is a combination of the two to make sure that we're in the right environment. We hold to values. We're not afraid to tell each other what our super strengths are. One of the things I do with all my teams, I go, tell each other why you're wonderful. Straight away, just turn to the person next to you, tell them why they're wonderful. And of course, I talk about super strengths. And I say, how often do you tell people why they're wonderful? 
course, the answer is we don't. Well, why would you not tell people all the good things? Because then it allows me to say to them, I think if you were to do this, you'd go to a high level of performance. That's good challenge. Peer group challenge is the best because we're aligned behind the team result. And that's where the brand comes. So where does the brand come? Where does everything else come from? It becomes because the brand of your team means that you have these key components in place, which can only bode well for any product, any group. There's an energy then that comes from the team because we don't want to let each other down. And that's the only way that you get to the highest levels of a, of, of a good brand, a good product and something where you're leaving something behind that legacy. Mm, fascinating. Absolutely. I, I just add one little extra thing there. Uh, recently, I was interviewing Rebecca D. Costa. Uh, she's an American futurist, a very famous American futurist that advised Steve Jobs and people like that. And she says, pre-adaptation is important rather than fast ad adaptation. You can't do fast adaptation, but the real pre-adaptation where you know something's going to happen. So why not do something about it is really important. Completely. But that's about having a growth mindset. So what I would say, Malcolm, this is where I would always say that conscious leader is realizing that you'll never be a, you'll never be a full leader. They don't exist. The perfect leader does not exist. There's always room to grow. And even when Obama was president, he had self-help books on his desk. So you look at it and think, you know, people that supposedly are gifted leaders, what they're realizing is this is a long journey. You'll never get there. You'll never quite get there because yeah. sometimes it'll be good. Sometimes the pressure of work and everything else and, and we're human beings, so we have frailties, we will stray. It's just realizing that what can I do is I can realize why I am straying. And that pre-adaptivity for me is innovation. It's also thinking the world is changing and will continue to change. What do I need to do to give myself a set of fusion skills? And that's where the best leaders come into play because it's not about knowledge is one thing. But I need a set of skills, communication, resilience, adaptability, flexibility, um, the ability to present my ideas, having a super North Star. There's just a series of skills that we know mean that you'll be good in any environment. I, I'm not an expert in business by far. I'm still a novice in everything that I do because most of the people that I'm working with now have been in this business for 20 and 30 years. But it doesn't mean I can't make a good decision when I hear information or I can look at things. It doesn't mean I can't present this information. What it means is what I'm doing is using my other skills to assist me on this journey. Yeah, I quite agree on that. Uh, we're all still learning. And by the way, of the 250 plus uh, leaders and CEOs that I've interviewed since March of 2020, which is quite a lot around the world, they're saying exactly the same thing. We're still learning. We're yeah. still learning. And particularly in this strange time at the moment. Floyd, in what key, say, three areas or elements, do you think leaders of today are not sharp enough at the moment to be effective leaders of tomorrow? Uh, again, I, I, I'm going to come over a couple of things, Malcolm, and, and say some, some similar things to what I've just said. It is about direction of travel and communicating it. However good you think you have a super North Star. And actually most CEOs I come across, when I sit down with them and drill it out of them, they will come up with what the super North Star is. And generally the best ones will not be talking about EBITDA, about money. It will be about what are they trying to do to change the world. And I remember talking to one um, CEO about this and he, he kept on coming back to it's about profits, it's about this. And I went, no, you're not, you're not getting what I'm saying. Tell me what you're, why are you in this organization? And of course, when he then broke down and said, actually, do you know what I want to do? I want to change the world. I want to make sure everybody, and of course, then it became magical. I just went, mm -hmm. how many people have heard you say that? And of course, he went, nobody. I went, well, why do you think you're in a difficult position as it is at this moment? Because nobody understands you. We can't get to the heart of what makes you tick. And that ethical um, ability now is probably more important than ever before. Again, as you talk about conscious leader with the community and the world itself. So leaders need to articulate where they're going and whatever they think they're doing, times that by 10 and then another 10 to make sure it's, it's consistent. Yeah, I like the times 10 approach. Yeah, I like that one. And 10. Um, and and the, 10. <laughs> right. resilience. What I come back to is I, I hear a lot about um, mental well-being and, and, and mental health, and I work a lot in this area. But what I want... What I try to do is say this is about opportunity and thriving in these environments. I don't want people to get into the stage of thinking that mental health, there's a far right edge of, edge of mental health, mm -hmm. which requires a lot of support and help. And then there's the normal stresses and strains of being involved in life. 
And therefore, I think within it, that resilience, mental and physical resilience is important. That is about what the Dalai Lama calls wise selfishness, which is taking time out to recharge, to think, to plan. It's also about having the right psychological resources so that you can be consistently good, but also making sure your teams are in the same space. So again, it's about that collective sensitivity and empathy for yourself and the people that are around you. And then come back to taking time out to think and to plan, to articulate the plan, and then to make sure that you're delivering on the elements that you create in that plan, the milestones, they're clear, short and sharp, successful elements that you can celebrate success on. You get the dopamine, the endorphin hits, and then you move on to the next place. But you celebrate success and you just readjust the compass as you get to each milestone. You just tweak it slightly so you're not completely off track and then you move forward. I think those are still the key areas. Again, keep it simple. Don't make the world's not that complex in lots of respects. We can come back to what do I actually need to do just to keep myself and my team, my organization on point? Those will be the things I think you need to have in place. Don't overcomplicate something that's not complex, just means that you've got to articulate it well and take people with you. Highest form of leadership, leadership without authority. People follow you because you've got the right story to tell them. Excellent, yes. And I really like that bit, don't overcomplicate. Let me go back to conscious leadership and planet, people and profits. Let's talk of planet first. Where do you think the conscious leader should show leadership as regards the planet? Um, my own view straight away is that you are looking at the community that you're involved in. So I think, first of all, we can do lots of things to change the community and looking at um, those simple things that can have great impact in making sure that people realize that a thriving community helps with children's education, helps with parenthood, helps with uh, the workforce. So I think um, leaders should look at the community and how they can assist that, certainly in educational terms, because again, the generation that's coming through and um, will hopefully be also holding them to account on the global issues. And we know there are significant global issues, biodiversity and the environment itself, deforestation, you've got pollution, you've got a multitude of other popular, you've got a thousand and one things we can look at. But I think leaders should also be looking at that legacy. What is their, what is their organization also doing to give back to global, um, global, global problems in this respect? And again, I think education is a critical one because I think the youth of today will be the ones that change this yeah. in the future. But I also think it's about how they then look at their products, how they package them, how they communicate them. And I think all organizations now will need to look at this seriously because they won't get the right workforce without doing it because there's a generation coming through that will demand that there is something different about this organization. Excellent. Yes. And I totally agree. Okay. Now I'll move to the second P, which is people. I'm a total believer in the richness of diversity and inclusion, especially on the gender agenda. But it seems to me that change is happening too slowly. Am I right or wrong? And if it needs to accelerate, how can it be done? Such a brilliant question. And now um, I actually looked at this when I, when I realized this might come up. I thought, oh, that's, that's a great question. Things I've always been surrounded by talented women, always in my life since I was a child. My yeah. mum was super talented. So I'll always look at it from a perspective of I know women are more than talented enough to be involved in um, whatever they want to be. And all the women around me have gone on and been quite successful in this world. However, I work with every sector. And of course, I go into boardrooms and it is full of white middle-aged men, predominantly. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we can't get away from that fact. So it's changed happening slowly the answer is yes it is so i also then i decided i looked at it, i thought i have my opinions but what i then did was i, I decided to before i give you my opinion i thought i'm asking a number of different women well actually what do you think and and the consensus probably was that very few of them wanted it to be a quota very few most of them are yeah. strong enough of mind to turn around and say no no i don't want to be just part of a quota i want to be there on merit so i thought well there's a balance to this because if it's if it's just on merit, until you get rid of con unconscious bias within a population, and that is really important. So first of all, I would hammer home an unconscious bias um, program so that people just realize, look, I don't care who you are, you need to think. There may be elements where you are unaware of why you think or do certain things. I think every organization should have a clear leadership program that looks at diversity, not just gender, but diversity, 
with a clear view of how people can get onto the board and those things are put in place. And I personally would say to every group, you have got, let's say within three to five years, if you have not done it yourself, then it, the quota, quota will be imposed. So I would look at it and give everybody the opportunity. Again, as we said, pre-adapt. Yep. And do something like this, because I think that probably fits well. Um, but I would also be clear, if this is not done, if you have not picked up the baton and done something about this to make sure that you are um, selecting and developing the right people to also have that diversity, because without it, you just can't do well, um, it will be imposed upon you. So yeah, yeah. make the call. Yeah. And, and at this time as well, Floyd, you know, where we're undergoing change with the pandemic and so on. So it's the right time to do it. So, again, just reminding people that uh, viewers and listeners on the screen behind me is the URL for, to go and find out more about Floyd and his Compass program. It's floydwoodrow.com. That's floydwoodrow.com. And now the final P is profits, which any business, even a nonprofit, calling it surplus needs if it's to exist. I suggest to you though, many businesses fail to make these profits as they come up with many profit creating strategies, but fail to execute them. What's your thoughts here? It's an interesting one. I think on, again, profit for me is necessary in any organization. I think we've got to be clear. Um, again, you have profit in order to make sure that you, one, are sustainable. You can be innovative, you can be creative, you can keep in the marketplace. And remember, the legacy is important here because you want to have a business that you hand over and pass on to the next group coming through. I think what the, the All Blacks, the, uh, that famous rugby to do is hand over the jersey in a better place than when you arrived. Well, the best way to do that is that you've got to create profit. But of course, using that profit in the appropriate way is also critical. And I think... What I would say within this, it comes back down to, again, having organizations that have a clear super north star on what they're trying to achieve. But the strategy and taking time out to plan effectively is where these strategies can actually take hold. And also a ruthless understanding of, of that ability to do lessons learned. And what I would say is most of the lessons that have been learned across the board are in are there for people to look at. There are very few new lessons. In fact, I, I, I think there probably aren't any new lessons. I think everything is there for an organization to look at so that you can be just clear on how you maximize um, your strategy to get the best out of the organization. So I, I would say that you are correct. Most groups don't do that analysis to the degree that they should. And then that profit um, should be used effectively to grow, to develop. Of course, when you've got shareholders, there's an element of paying back because, again, that's that's how organisations work. But I would just come back to it requires the board to be really clinical on how they operate and work together um, to have the right strategy in this area. Yeah. Floyd, I love your North Star analogy. So here in Northumberland, where we are dark skies, I'll be reflecting upon that tonight as I look up and think about what you've been talking. Floyd, last question. And I'd like to give all my guests three wishes. If you had three wishes for what leaders should be doing now to be fit for purpose in the near future, what three things would your wishes be? And the most important thing for me is one is looking at global issues. I think it's actually when you look at your organization, think about how you play your part in the world that we want to leave behind. So the legacy, I think it's really important that organizations, the highest form of leadership, as I said, is to lead without authority. I think most individuals that are at a board level should be thinking about that legacy they're going to hand over. And again, making sure the world is in a better place. So their decisions, as I said, from a community and a global perspective, become paramount. And I think they should Again, look at their profits, look at what they're doing. How can they have an impact in that area? That would be my first wish, that all organizations have that at the, the highest levels of their thought process. The second one is that they are helping to educate um, the community. So they're actually going into schools. They're making sure that the most disadvantaged children in the community have the same life chances as um, their peers. If you bear in mind that children, when they leave primary school, are a year behind. By the time they leave secondary, are 23 months. Um, we need to do something differently because all of these children have ambition. And I work with the most disadvantaged children in the country. 
And I can tell you, every one of them has ambition. Every one of them has something that they would love to try to do, but they don't have the opportunity. And think about the talent that we miss by not assisting those children to grow well. I think everybody has a responsibility to do that. And we just do not do that as a country. I also think it's important for me from a leadership perspective that we actually stop looking at what, um, where our disagreements are and what we have as similarities. And this is from a political level for me, is I'm tired of politicians arguing over things that are just fundamental. So if we just took, again, education, if we took the health service, if we took policing, and we just realized we kind of want the same things, but what you need is five, 10, 15, 20 year plans. We can't stick to three, four, or indeed in some cases with organizations, the next three or six months to make decisions. We have to have people that can think, again, out to 20, 30 years. And isn't it interesting when you look at a lot of the, in, the structures that are in place today, it was because people um, had a view of, I'm going to leave a legacy that I probably won't ever see. I'm going to set up educational systems, forestry. We're going to do things that are long term. And that means you have to I do something, as I said, you may not even see the end and in, in your lifetime, but what we leave behind is for the next two, three, four, five generations. We do not have enough people actually thinking in that way. So those would be pretty wishes. They are brilliant, uh, brilliant response there, Floyd. Floyd Woodrow, you truly are an inspiration. And I hope that viewers will not only watch this video a few times, but recommend all their colleagues and friends to watch it. You can learn so much from it. Thanks for a great interview. Malcolm, thank you very much. If I just may also add, I have a foundation called the Compass for Life Foundation. We go into the most disadvantaged schools. We do all of that work pro bono. Um, so any assistance from, a, and I mean that from an ability to look at how you could assist as a business in the local community, then by all means get in touch with me and I can give you some thoughts about how you can transform the educational uh, abilities of not just disadvantaged children, but every child within the community. Thank you a, very much. A great response there. And I'll just remind you, everybody, floydwoodrow.com, floydwoodrow.com.